Ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to thank you for the invitation to speak today uh, and also for the initiative behind uh, this conference. As Kenneth said, we are awaiting for two chubby, round panda teddy bears to drop down in Copenhagen Zoo, accompanied by Asian-style symphony music, I've heard. It gives us a good opportunity here to ponder over Denmark's relationship with China, the world's largest communist dictatorship. That's very important to remember, the world's largest communist dictatorship. We often seem to forget that. Of course, it's important what we, uh, we and NATO at all times uh, keep a watchful eye regarding Russia's missiles at Kaliningrad, not forgetting the Russian cyber attacks but all of this, we and our rich and capable allies will manage quite well. One can accuse President Putin and his generals for a great deal, but one thing they are not, and that is stupid. They are fully aware that a Russian military attack on a NATO country is Russian suicide. So the military threat from a not so wealthy Russia is nothing compared to the threat that China is already posing and who week by week grows even stronger and yet more dangerous. Ask all those out there in the South China Sea and the Pacific as such how they feel about the threat from China. Ask politicians and military analysts out there in Japan and South Korea in Singapore, uh, in Taiwan, in the Philippines, in Australia, in New Zealand, about how they see the situation. And all of them, I guarantee, including the United States, are fully aware of what's going on with China. So with the uh, shipyards and the steel industries are busy in China, the arrival of two choppy pandas is being prepared as the visible proof of the warm relationship between China and Denmark. Yes, because Denmark, in the name China, brings on so many happy thoughts. We trade, we cut the little mermaid off her stone at Langelinje in the harbor and sent her off to Shanghai. We pat the pandas' fat tummies together and we exchange cultures, we play at sharing Hans Christian Andersen. <clears throat> Ministers from each country meet again and again, give each other panda hugs, and promise peace and eternal loyalty. And then we make sure, because we are so friendly, that not one single visiting communist comrade feels offended by anything anything at all. So very gently, as only a Copenhagen police officer can, peaceful protesters are gently being pushed away and flags confiscated because our communist guests have to be spared for anything in the world to see a flag from Tibet. All of this I might be become accustomed to if I could just feel free and be free of hearing Danish politicians using the same rhetorical drivel to describe China. They once, in a not so distant past, used to describe the Soviet Union, saying, yes, yes, human rights may be questioned, but China has, though, lifted many of its people out of poverty, unquote. Well, China is on the go all over the place. And as you know, <coughs> has repeated, tried to create a presence in Greenland. The first two serious attempts were the attempt to take over the naval station Grønnedal. Also, the financing of three major airports was thwarted thanks to the resolute intervention of the Danish prime minister inspired, I believe, from the firm position of the United States. We see constantly 
that China is in the process of trying to penetrate its way into both Denmark and Greenland. And at the same time, as China is trying to wiggle its way in, under the cover of business partnership, the communist regime has in recent years run an effective political harassment against Denmark. The Chinese themselves describe this as, quote, enforcing the one China policy. policy. And this is done, of course, with the most intolerable arrogance. China inter interprets that only that one China policy in a sense that if Denmark, both the official Denmark and private institutions in some way or another would presuppose, for example, in so much as talk to or meet with representatives of the oppressed Tibet or Taiwan, China immediately becomes furious and threatening. The threats always come sophistically enough, never by mail or by letter, but always by telephone or by personal contact. In 2009, it was just about to destroy everything for Danish export companies when Prime Minister Lars Løkke Rasmussen kindly received the Dalai Lama for a talk at Marienborg, <coughs> the Prime Minister's residence. Although the Lama did not have politics on the agenda at all, 40 export companies approached the government and complained of their distress. Everything they said with connection to Denmark seemed to have stalled. Containers were forgotten on the Harbour Quay. No new licenses were given. Harassment and even more harassment. China makes sure, of course, that it adheres to all the WTO rules on the surface because they never leave traces of evidence when they threaten and harass both Danish business and the official Denmark. Most people here know how that story ended. As soon as China had made the Danish government send the so-called verbal note with precisely the text that China demanded, namely that Denmark assured that we, quote, oppose independence for Tibet, opposed independence for Tibet. Then suddenly, next day, quite miraculously, everything improved for Danish export. It was just as it was before the Dalai Lama's unfortunate visit. Last time that the official Denmark, as far as I know, was threatened like this, was in connection with the Foreign Policy Committee trips to Peking a year ago, and this is probably not that well known to the public, but I'm gonna tell you now. Our Chinese hosts had somehow unearthed the fact that Tibet's exiled prime minister would be visiting the Danish parliament and had requested a meeting with the speaker of the Danish parliament Mrs. Pia Kerskor. At a meeting with our hosts out there in Beijing, we received a very aggressive oral dressing down from a Chinese minister. And he instructed me as chairman of the committee and party member of the speaker of the parliament that I should instruct her to say no to the visit. Now, anyone who has tried ever to instruct Pia Kers or anything, <laughs> they haven't got away with it. At a meeting with our hosts, we received this dressing down. I had to instruct her to say no to the visit. And we who were present amongst us, three ex-foreign ministers of Denmark, were absolutely stunned. They have never ever in their diplomatic career been told off like that. We felt that as if we were children. As fate have it, 
it's a speaker, the parliament, could not in fact find time in her busy schedule to meet with Tibet's exiled prime minister. So instead I, as the chairman of the Foreign Policy Committee, had a quiet and very interesting meeting with him in my office. The next day, my administration in the committee received a phone call from the China's embassy in Copenhagen with a very angry protest that I had, in fact, held the meeting. Note that, as always, it was just a phone call, nothing recorded. China never sends emails or letters of anything and therefore never leaves a trace of their threats and harassments of business in the, or, or the official Denmark. This is how they operate everywhere in the world. It is common practice with elegance and with sophisticated cynicism. The communist regimes manage to threaten and harass without any evidence appearing anywhere. Let me give you some more examples of how China harasses and threatens without it becoming official. Several of them I have experienced personally, as in the example above in Beijing. The Speaker of the Parliament, Pia Kersko, who at the time was the chairman of the Danish People's Party, was to receive a Taiwanese order presented by a minister from Taiwan. When it became known where the ceremony was supposed to take place, a well-known restaurant, a hotel north of Copenhagen, the restaurant in question was called by the Chinese embassy and threatened that if they held the reception, they would never again, as they often did, use the restaurant nor the hotel. Another, a Chinese restaurant, of which I also know the name, but I do not want to disclose here, was threatened that if they let the Danish-Taiwanese Friendship Association come inside to dine, they would never again be allowed to deliver food to the Chinese embassy, which they had often done in the past. Hotel Marienlust in Elsinore was booked for a conference on, on Taiwan and very graciously hoisted the flag of Taiwan in honor of the many participants taking part from Taiwan. This caused a flag war. China's embassy first tried with a threatening telephone message to the hotel director that the flag must be removed. When this did not help, the foreign minister was called by the Chinese embassy and threatened to do something, which of course they immediately tried to do. Xin Yun, an internationally admired and celebrated dance and music show formed in New York, known for its impressive professionalism and its artistic top class performances, presenting the Falun Gong religion through classic Chinese ethnic folk and story based dances. It has been performing for full houses on the biggest stages around the world, for example, on New York's Broadway and in London's West End, and has achieved accolades everywhere. They have repeatedly tried unsuccessful, unsuccessfully to perform their show at the Royal Theatre in Copenhagen, and have been rejected with the world's most amazing reason. Quote, the performance does not live up to the Royal Theatre's artistic requirements. Yes, we must have very high standards and expectations here in Denmark. However, the actual reason for the rejection is quite different. I must not speculate in the justification. Just note that in connection with Shen Yun, there has been a lively dialogue between the theater and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Other cases that may not be so well known can be briefly mentioned. Some of them also quoted by Thomas Vogt on radio 24-7. Um, 
<coughs> can be briefly mentioned. For instance, for example, Chinese pressure <coughs> on the Danish film festival, where trade problems were threatened if they did not made, make the right decision. In Gotthob Nuuk, two Greenland officials received Chinese demands and were asked to ensure that Tibetan sympathizer had to leave a film festival. And of course, after pressure from China, the SAS, Scandinavian Airlines System, changed its name to Taiwan on its maps to Taiwan, China. Small examples, yes, and maybe so. Yet if all the hundreds of these small examples, of which I don't know, are put together, it suddenly becomes quite a different story. Let me conclude with a little glimpse from our Danish history, which you can then ponder about and think about. The Danish press was once blessed with an excellent journalist, Franz von Jessen. He was during the middle of the 1930s, before the occupation, together with other important journalists from the Parliament's Press Society convened for a meeting with the Foreign Minister Pimunk for a confidential conversation regarding the so-called serious businesses, namely the press coverage of the development in our large neighboring country to the south, Germany. Franz von Jessen described after the liberation of Denmark years later what had happened at the meeting. The foreign minister had previously, for the sake of our export industry, encouraged some journalists not to mention this or that about the goings on in Germany. <clears throat> and that things could obviously take a dangerous turn for business and for Denmark. The foreign minister pointed out a number of ongoing trade negotiations with Germany where as a result of incentive, insensitive newspaper articles, things were getting more and more difficult to deal with. So he directly asked the press people present to refrain from mentioning anything that would weaken the potential for good trading performance. As the foreign minister put it, quote, if it is a strict requirement to keep silent and tolerate the situation, then it would be even heavier to bear the responsibility for a chain challenge to the dangers." Unquote. The government's call calls to the press to show understanding at Denmark's difficult situation had its effect. More and more challenging reports regarding the situation in Germany disappeared from the Danish press. And the journalists who wrote articles, anyway, got into trouble. The first direct victim was Berniske Tidnes journalist Nikolai Bledel, who, after persistently warning about the Nazis' behavior towards the Jews, were fired as a weekly commentator in Denmark's radio after direct pressure from Nazi Germany. Franz von Jessen described how P. Munk had acted during the meeting with the journalists and what he said. Quote, in, this, in his friendly manner and with his sympathetic smile, he also sought in a cleverly balanced presentation to make us understand that in times like these, the Danish press had much less need for pens than for felted shoes. Go quietly talk softly, creep silently around the problems despite how dangerous they can look and how close they seem to move into our lives." Unquote. And P. Munch continued, therefore, it is wise for a country like Denmark to maintain the objective mind. And I believe that the majority of the Danish people also show such a desire. It is of great importance in this very dangerous situation that there is no distrust of us elsewhere. I ask the press to keep these views in mind." Unquote. 
It is the same way that Communist China's embassy operates as was Germany's embassy in the 1930s. In its dictatorial manner, with the Danish Minister of Foreign Affairs bringing complaints regarding abusive newspaper articles and on who visited Denmark or who stayed here. In addition to its angry protests to the government, there were at that time also hidden threats of trade boycotts as well as to the restaurateurs of others who laid house for meetings where Germany came under verbal attacks. Today, what we have been addressing has become quite normal in that the Chinese embassy harasses the hotels and restaurants <coughs> that house delegations from Taiwan or Tibet or to people from Falun Gong. In the 1930s, many leading Danish business people pleaded constantly with the press that they be more large and understanding towards Nazi Germany. As a newspaper, Börsen wrote, and that's another quote, the last, it cannot be the official Denmark's or the press's task to further complicate the commercial policy intercession by interfering in political matters in Germany in an untimely manner, unquote. Well, what is that saying that we all know? There is nothing new under the sun. Thank you very much.